Well, welcome to this talk. My name's John Campbell, and I'm going to be talking you through some of the prefixes we use in medical terminology in this presentation. Now, the prefix comes in front of a word and gives us information about the word that's going to come. So whenever we see a on front of a word, that means without. So apnea, achlorhydria, a tony, all mean without the word that is to come. Now what I've done in these presentations is I've made the prefix in red. So we see the word there is apnea, apnea, pronounced apnea. And in the States you wouldn't include the O in the word. So pnea means breath or air. So apnea means without breath or air, a apnea pronounced apnea. So someone who is apneic is not breathing. Now the chlorhydria refers to the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So achlorhydria would be a condition where there is no hydrochloric acid in the stomach. In practice it would mean there is less hydrochloric acid in the stomach than normal. Atony. Now the tony part there, or the tenny part, T-O-N-Y, that refers to the tone of a muscle. So atony is a condition where the muscle has lost its tone, the muscle has lost its strength. So for example in the post-operative situation there could be a gastrointestinal atony and if that's bad it could be a paralytic ileus where the bowel isn't working at all for a period of time. Or there could be a uterine uh, atony, that's loss of tone in the uterine musculature after childbirth. No, normally, of course, it's the contraction of the uterine muscle which compresses the vessels and reduces the blood flow. So if there's uterine atony after muscle after childbirth, then there can be more bleeding because the bleeding vessels are not clamped down on it lacks the direct pressure. So a in front of a word simply means without the bit of the word which is then to come. Now, an, a-n in front of a word as a prefix, also means without. So a or an in front of a word actually mean the same thing. So anaerobic. Anaerobic metabolism, for example, is metabolism that takes place in the absence of oxygen, giving rise to the production of lactic acid. So anaerobic means without oxygen. Or we may have anaerobic organisms in a wound, causing wound infection. Anaerobic organisms being organisms which thrive in an ox in an oxygen depleted atmosphere. Or anemic. Now, emic, a e m i c, is to do with the blood. So, if someone is anemic, they have no blood. They are anemic. In practice, of course, it doesn't mean they have no blood at all. It means they have lowered concentrations of haemoglobin in their blood. And there is therefore a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of that blood. But technically, anemia means without blood. So there's reduced amounts of blood. Now, if you go to the dentist to get your tooth out, you'd be very grateful for a, uh, an anaesthetic. An anaesthesia, an, without, anaesthesia means feeling. So anaesthesia literally means without feeling, which of course is very desirable if a doctor or a dentist is inflicting something painful on us. So anaesthesia literally without feeling. So remember the prefix a or an always means without. Now anti a-N-T-I means against or opposed to. So an antibiotic is against biological life, literally, against biotic life. And specifically, this is to do with bacteria. So an antibiotic will kill bacteria. That is what it is against. Antiperistalsis. Now, peristalsis, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract, will propel things from the direction of the mouth to the direction of the anus. 
So normally when we swallow this peristaltic, waves are going from the mouth down the esophagus towards the stomach. But if there's antiperistalsis, that will be going in the opposite direction, as might occur in vomiting, where there is regurgitation against the normal physiological direction. So that would be antiperistalsis. An anti-inflammatory drug is going to act against inflammation. So, for example, steroid drugs such as hydrocortisone are going to be highly anti-inflammatory. They will act against, they will inhibit the anti-inflammatory response. Or we have a group of drugs called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are anti-inflammatory drugs, but which are not steroids, such as ibuprofen or indomethacin or aspirin. So they're anti-inflammatory because they're acting against the inflammatory response. Now, anti with an E, A-N-T-E, means before something, before in time. So, for example, antenatal, natal refers to birth. So antenatal would be care or a period of time before birth. So the antenatal period would be before the birth occurs. Antenatal care would be any care that occurs, really from the time of conception, right up until the time of birth. It is before the time of birth, so it's antenatal. Brady in front of a word always means slow. Bradypnea would be slow breathing. Bradycardia. Cardia is to do with the heart. So a bradycardia is a slow heart rate. Technically, any heart rate below 60 beats per minute, although we'd have to think about that in the context of the patient's physiological norm. But bradycardia, slow heart. Bradykinesia. Kinesia means to do with movement. So if someone has bradykinesia, their movements are slow, as, for example, might occur in Parkinson's disease. Cardia, cardiac, cardio means to do with the heart. So in a cardiac arrest, the heart is arrested and there is essentially no cardiac output. Cardiomegaly. Well, cardio means heart. So can you see there's a heart megaly, cardiomegaly. And megaly means pathologically enlarged or big. So a megastructure is a big structure. A megaly is when the thing being described is enlarged. So a cardiomegaly is an enlarged heart, as may occur, for example, in chronic left ventricular failure. There is an abnormally enlarged heart. Cardiology, or a cardiologist. Cardiology is the study and science of the heart. A cardiologist is someone who studies the heart, usually referring to a doctor who specialises in cardiac diseases. Now, coli means to do with the bile. You might remember that when red blood cells have lived for about 120 days, they're broken down by the macrophages in places such as the spleen. But that bilirubin is released. And the bilirubin travels to the liver and is incorporated into the bile. The bile then goes down the hepatic ducts and is stored in the gallbladder. So coli as a prefix means bile, to do with bile. Now, when I've got a three-part word in this series, I've put the prefix in red and the suffix in blue and the root of the word in black in the middle. So here we have a word, cholecystectomy. So chole is bile, cyst is a fluid-filled space relating to the bladder. So the cholecyst is the gallbladder. An ectomy is a surgical removal of. So chole, bile, cyst, bladder, ectomy removal of, surgical removal of the gallbladder. Cholangitis refers to inflammation of the bile ducts. So coal is bile, itis inflammation of, cholangitis inflammation of the bile ducts. Now most commonly this will be caused by ascending bacterial infection, 
coming up from the duodenum. So for example, if there's a blockage caused by uh, gallstones or a tumour, there can be associated infection of the bile ducts, leading to inflammation of the bile ducts. Or there's another fortunately rare condition called primary sclerosing cholangitis. Sclerosing means hardening of a tissue. And in primary sclerosing cholangitis, it's probably an autoimmune disease. It's certainly idiopathic. We're not quite sure what causes this. But there's inflammation leading to fibrosis, leading to obstruction, over time leading to cirrhosis and uh, liver failure. So it can be quite a chronic condition of uh, this primary cholangitis. Cholecystitis. Cholie bile, cyst, bladder, so that's the gallbladder. Itis is inflammation of. So cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. For example, there might be a stone obstructing the cystic duct, which is the duct communicating to and from the gallbladder. If that's blocked, the bile won't be able to escape. The bile will be retained in the gallbladder. It will become static. And whenever we have stasis, infection is likely to develop and the infection can cause the inflammation. And in fact, if this is severe, the, there can be pus developing inside the gallbladder. That would be a condition called empyema of the gallbladder. But in cholecystitis caused by infection, there'd be pain in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. And the patient can be very unwell. They can be fever and even sepsis. Now, col, if it's just C-O-L, as we see in the red prefix here, means to do with the colon. So col for colon, the large intestine. And you probably know this begins down in the lower right portion of the abdomen with the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. On the lower left side of the abdomen, sigmoid colon, rectum and anus, all that large intestine. So colostomy, a colostomy is an opening Ostomy means opening into, a surgical opening. So a colostomy is where the bowel opens normally onto the wall of the abdomen, formed by a surgeon, when usually part of the colon is taken away for malignant reasons, for example, and an opening of the colon is made onto the abdominal wall, colostomy. Colectomy, well, ectomy means removal of, surgical removal of. So a whole colectomy, a complete colectomy might be fairly rare, but you can get various forms of partial colectomy where part of the colon is removed. Colitis is inflammation of the colon. This could be a simple viral or bacterial infection. Or it could be ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory disease affecting the colon. Now coliforms... Coliforms are the sort of bacteria that normally live in the colon. So actually when you pass feces, when the, the stool, if the stools are dried, about a third of the dry weight of the stools is actually uh, bacteria. So coliform are the type of bacteria, E. coli for example, that are normally found in the colon. In the colon it's fine, but if they get into other places such as the bladder, they can cause infections such as cystitis if the bladder is infected. So coliforms are the type of bacteria from the colon. Now I wasn't sure whether to include melancholy because it's not really a modern medical term. But melancholy literally means black bile. And, and this goes back to pre-scientific days when people believed in the humours. So if you meet someone and they say, oh, you're in good humour today, that, that goes back to this humoral theory of disease where there were four humours, blood, um, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm were the four humours. Of course, this is all pre-scientific nonsense today, really. But it was believed that low mood and depression was caused by too much black bile. So melan, as in melanocyte, is black, coli, bile black bile 
So um, melancholy, feeling depressed, feeling fed up, having low mood. Um, that's where it derives from, melancholy. The prefix cyst, a cyst is a fluid filled space. And we normally use it as a prefix to mean bladder. So we've already noted that you can have a cholecystitis. Cyst in that case is bladder, but cholei is the gallbladder. But when we use cyst just on its own, we usually mean the urinary bladder. So cystitis is inflammation of the urinary bladder. An ovarian cyst would be a collection or a fluid filled space that occurs in the ovary, or it could occur in other places as well, but it just means a fluid filled space. Cystoscopy would be to look into the bladder. Scopy means to look into or to look at. Endo means inside. So endoscopy would be to look in side endoscopy so a colonoscopy looking into the colon a gastroscopy looking into the stomach a cystoscopy looking into the bladder are all forms of endoscopy it is any time we are looking inside endocardium so the endocardium is the inside layer of the heart the outside layer is the pericardium the middle layer is the myocardium and the inner layer of the heart is the endocardium the layer inside the heart lining the chambers of the heart endocarditis would be inflammation of the endocardium the endometrium is the inside layer of the uterus so endo simply means inside enteric comes from the greek word enterokos which means intestine so it means intestinal so enteric fever would be a fever that derives from an intestinal infection. Enteric feeding would be putting food directly into the gastrointestinal tract. So nasogastric tubes, we often call those enteric tubes. In actual fact, the nasogastric, if they're enteric, they go straight into the intestine, but we normally call it enteric feeding. Though having said that, any time you eat normally, that's enteric feeding because it's going into the intestine enteric coated would mean that a medication is covered with a special coating so it's not absorbed in the stomach but goes straight through to the intestine enterovirus would be a virus that infects the intestine gastroenterologist or gastro is stomach and then the uh, entero part would be the intestine so that would be a stomach intestine and an ologist or a logist is an expert. So gastroenterologist is someone who is an expert in the stomach, intestine, yeah, the stomach and the intestine together. They are an expert in those two things. Normally, of course, it means a doctor who studies diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, dys, D-Y-S, is one of the more common prefixes, and it means an abnormal or painful situation so dysuria the prefix is dis the suffix is urea painful passage of urine dysmenorrhea rhea means to flow the m part there the men part is to do with menstruation so dysmenorrhea means painful menstruation pain associated with menstruation often referred to as period pains, will be dysmenorrhea. Dyspnea, the pinea part, is to do with breathing. So dyspnea is difficulty or pain breathing. Normally we use the term dyspnea to indicate abnormal or difficult breathing when the patient finds it difficult to get their breath. Now don't get the next two mixed up. Dysphagia, the phagia part is eating or swallowing. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Dysphasia, the phasia part relates to speech. So dysphasia is difficulty with speech. Both of those, for example, can occur after cerebrovascular accidents. 
gast or gastro refers to the stomach. This is the anatomically precise stomach between the esophagus and the duodenum. So gastritis, inflammation of the stomach. Itis means inflammation of. Gastroscopy, to look into the stomach. Very often with an endoscopic gastroscopy tube. Gastroparesis. Now, paresis means a weakness. And sometimes, for example, in long-term diabetes, there's damage to the nerve supply to the stomach, which means there's a weakness in the stomach and it can't process the food properly. And that can result in vomiting, especially if the patients eat large meals. So gastro prefix, paresis suffix, paresis means weakness. Gly means to do with sugar. As we've said before, the sugar in the blood is glucose. So hypoglycemia, hypo, low, gly, sugar, emia in the blood, low blood sugar levels. Normally before below four millimoles. Glycogen is the storage molecule for glucose in the blood. So when the blood sugar levels rise, insulin is released and insulin has several functions, but one of them is it will convert glucose into glycogen, a polysaccharide insoluble storage molecule, and the glycogen is then stored in the liver and muscles. When the blood sugar levels drop, if people need to increase their blood glucose levels, then the hormone glucagon is released, and that will reconvert the glycogen from the insoluble glycogen form back into the soluble glucose form to restore and maintain homeostatic levels of blood glucose. Heme means to do with the blood. So H-A-E-M is the traditional English spelling. H-E-M is the American spelling, the US spelling. Doesn't make any difference, both mean blood. So hematuria, prefix Heme, suffix urea, that is blood in the urine, bleeding into the urine. Hematemesis, now amesis, means vomiting. So hematemesis is blood in the vomit. So this can be frank blood that looks like obvious, fairly fresh blood, or it can be altered blood. Because if people bleed into the stomach, then the blood is partly digested if it's there for a period of time. And then when it's vomited out, it looks like coffee grounds. We call this coffee ground vomit. So suspect frank blood and suspect coffee ground appearance as being hematemesis. Hemoptysis is the coughing up of blood from the respiratory tract. Typically that blood is reddish, fairly bright red and, and often frothy because it's mixed with sputum. And of course, the cause of all these things need to be explained. These are all serious clinical signs that can represent significant pathology that need to be explained. So we have hematology, and hematology is the study of blood. So a hematologist is someone who studies blood and blood diseases. Now, hemangioma, the heme bit on the front is blood. Angio, in the middle, the root there, is to do with blood vessels. And oma, O-M-A, means a lump. So a hemangioma is a collection of blood vessels that forms a lump under the skin. Oma means a lump. Sometimes these are called strawberry marks because the surface looks a bit like the surface of a, of a strawberry. Usually they're a bit raised, a bit red, and they might feel warm because of the, the there's more blood near the surface of the body. But remember the components of the word heme is the prefix, angio, the blood vessels, oma, lump, in. So it's literally blood, vessel, lump, hemangioma. Hemi, H-E-M-I, means half. So the earth has a northern hemisphere and it has a southern hemisphere, half spheres. Hemiplegia. Now, plegia means paralysis. Now, you probably know it's the right side of the brain that controls the left side of the body. And it's the left side of the brain that controls the right side of the body. So if there's a severe stroke that affects the right side of the brain, that can paralyze the left side of the body going all the way down the middle, down the symmetry line of the body. 
And plegia is paralysis, so hemiplegia would mean half of the body is paralysed. But alternatively, the body might not be paralysed, it might just be weaker on one side. So that would be a hemiparesis. So plegia means paralysis, paresis means weakness. Or there might be a root in the middle of a word with hemi at the front. Hemicolectomy. So hemi means half, col means colon, ectomy means surgical removal of. So a hemicolectomy would be a surgical removal of half of the colon, a hemicolectomy. Now hepatic or hepato is to do with the liver. So hepatocyte is a liver cell. Hepato is the prefix, liver. Site is cell. So the individual functional liver cells are the hepatocytes. Hepatitis, I-T-I-S, on the end is inflammation of. So hepatitis is inflammation of the liver for whatever cause. For example, it could be a viral infection causing hepatitis. Hepatomegaly. So prefix hepato, we know it's to do with the liver. Megaly means big or enlarged. So hepatomegaly would be an enlarged liver. For example, if someone's been drinking too much alcohol, the liver cells can fill up with fat, giving rise to an enlarged liver, a hepatomegaly. Or hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular is a primary tumour that begins in the hepatocytes. So unfortunately, it's relatively common to get malignancy in the liver as metastatic spread from the gastrointestinal tract. But a hepatocellular carcinoma is one which is a primary starting in the liver where the malignancy starts in the hepatocytes themselves. Hepatocellular carcinoma. Hyper means too high, hypo means too low, but we've actually dealt with these in some detail earlier on in this presentation. Lapero as a prefix means to do with the abdomen. So laparotomy, otomy means a surgical opening into. So laparotomy would be opening the abdomen. Laparoscopy would be looking into the abdomen perhaps using a surgical fibre optic device to look into the abdomen, laparoscopy. Lith or litho means a stone. So lithiasis is where there are stones present and of course these are completely pathological. So you might be sent for a lithotripsy. Tripsy means to crush or to break up or pulverise, it's Greek. So lithotripsy would be a crushing of a stone. Urolithiasis would be, uro is the urinary tract, lith is the stone, asis is condition of. So urolithiasis is when there is a condition of stones in the urinary tract. Of course, a pathological situation. Cholelithiasis is where the stones related to the biliary system so in cholelithiasis, stones can develop inside the gallbladder. They don't do too much damage in the gallbladder, but when they pass out into the cystic duct and the um, common bile duct, they certainly can cause severe pain, biliary colic. But look at the word cholei, bile, lith, stone, asis, condition of stones from the gallbladder or stones generated in the gallbladder, present in the gallbladder or present in the bile ducts, cholelithiasis. Now, in surgery, you might have come across a very undignified position called the lithotomy position. This is where the legs are put in stirrups and held up and apart, lith lithotomy. And this goes back to the very early days of surgery where people were put into this lithotomy position to remove bladder stones and the position has just stuck it's a lithotomy position lipo or lipid means fat so a fat is a lipid so lipemic would mean fat in the blood dyslipidemia 
would mean an abnormal profile of fats in the blood. So dis is abnormal or painful, in this case abnormal. Lipid is fat and emia is in the blood. So what you're supposed to have is a certain amount of high density lipoprotein and a certain amount of low density lipoprotein. The high density lipoprotein is protective against arterial disease, against atherosclerosis, whereas the low density lipoprotein is atherogenic, it will cause the condition. So if someone is dyslipidemic, if they have a high level of low density lipoprotein and or a low level of high density lipoprotein, predisposing them towards the development of atheroma. So they will be dyslipidemic and we would need to treat that with lifestyle and probably with statins. Lipoma is a fatty lump. So these can often occur under the skin, for example, they're, they're benign, but they form a fatty lump. And we can tell they're benign because they're soft and because they move freely between finger and thumb. And when we send samples to the histologists, they'll tell us that they are benign. But we're, they're often removed because they're inconvenient or cosmetically unsatisfactory. Lipoma. So lip, fat, oma, lump, lipoma. Mal is another very common prefix, meaning abnormal. So malfunction means that the function is not normal. Malabsorption means that the absorption is not normal. Very often referring to the absorption of nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract into the blood and lymphatic system. If there's not normal absorption, there can be malabsorption syndromes. Malnutrition means abnormal nutrition. If someone doesn't get enough of some nutrients they will be malnourished. Or indeed, if someone takes too many of some nutrients, particularly energy containing nutrients, such as fats and carbohydrates, they'll become obese. That's because they've got too much of a dietary component. They are malnourished. So malnutrition can mean too much or not enough of a nutrient. Malunion, that's the time often, a term often used in orthopedics where the bones don't heal together properly there's a malunion of a fracture or the fracture is healing in an abnormal position just means an abnormal union of bones mast is to do with the breast so mastectomy would be surgical removal of a breast mastitis is inflammation of a breast very often mastitis can occur as a complication of breastfeeding where there's bacterial infection in a breast, but does tend to resp respond very well to antibiotics, but a painful condition. Mastalgia, algia is pain. So mastalgia would be pain in a breast. And gynecomastia, we normally use this term to describe breast development in men. So when men develop breasts, we call that gynecomastia. For example, men that drink a lot of alcohol can develop gynecomastia. And it can also be a side effect of some medications or a feature of obesity. Myo is the prefix indicating muscle. So the myocardium is the muscle of the heart. So myocarditis would be inflammation of the muscle of the heart as for example might be caused by a viral infection causing viral myocarditis. Myopathy is disease in a muscle. Myo muscle pathy disease of myopathy. Myoma, oma means a lump so a myoma would be a benign lump in a muscle as opposed to a myosarcoma, which would be a malignant lump in a muscle. Rhabdomyolysis. Right, the myo part, you know that means muscle. Lysis means to break up. And the rhabdo there actually means uh, rod-shaped or straight. So this is breakup of the skeletal muscles. There can be a rhabdomyolysis. The problem with rhabdomyolysis is it will release free haemoglobin into the blood and that can clog up in the glomeruli 
causing an acute renal failure, rhabdomyolysis. Neph or nephro means to do with the kidneys. So a nephrologist is someone who studies the kidneys and kidney diseases. Nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic is where the glomeruli in the kidneys become leaky and can leak protein into the urine, causing a protein urea. This can diminish the amount of protein in the blood and potentially lead to edema, nephrotic syndrome. Nephritis, itis is inflammation of the kidneys. Pylonephritis, the pylo part relates to the renal pelvis. The, uh, the neph part is the kidney. The itis is inflammation of. So pylonephritis means inflammation of the renal pelvis, the renal parenchyma, the renal tissue itself, inflammation of. And it's usually caused by bacterial infection and a very serious condition it is or can be. Nephrotoxic means that something is toxic to the kidneys. So quite a few toxins can be nephrotoxic. And we have to be careful with some antibiotics, gentamicin for example. If we give too much gentamicin that will be nephrotoxic. So we have to monitor the gentamicin levels to make sure we're not in the nephrotoxic range, we're not damaging the patient's kidneys. Hydronephrosis, hydro is water, actually means urine. Well, it literally means water, but in practice it's urine. Neph is the kidneys and osis is condition of. So hydronephrosis is where the urine dams, bank, dams back up into the kidneys. And the hydronephrosis, when the kidneys are waterlogged with urine over time, will cause renal failure. Oligo, oligo means few or not enough. So oligurea would be low volumes of urine. Oligospermia would mean that there's not enough sperm in the seminal fluid, meaning conception is less likely to occur. Oligohandrosis is a deficiency in the amount of amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus, potentially giving rise to congenital birth defects and sometimes what we call a Potter syndrome. Peri means about or around or surrounding. So pericarditis, well the pericardium is the layer around the heart. So pericarditis would be inflammation of that pericardial layer. Perinatal is the time around about birth, just before during and just after birth. And we sometimes talk about perioperative care, the care of the patient before surgery, during surgery, and in the post-operative period, perioperative. Prost means to do with the prostate gland. So prostatitis would be inflammation of the prostate gland causing pain in the perineal area between the legs and sometimes causing blood in the seminal fluid, so-called hematospermia. Prostatism would just be an abnormal condition of the prostate gland. So very often as men age, they get benign prostatic hyperplasia, giving rise to lower urinary tract symptoms. But of course, prostate cancer can develop as well and is, is perhaps, in fact, is the most common cancer diagnosed overall in men. Fortunately, prostate cancer affects older men rather than young men. Prostatectomy, well, we know the ectomy part means surgical removal of. So this could be removal of all of the prostate gland or part of the prostate gland. So for example, commonly we do a transurethral resection of prostate where the prostate gland is reamed out from the inside to reduce the obstruction caused by the prostatic enlargement. Pyro is the Greek word for fire. So a pyrexia is when someone has a high body temperature. They are hotter than we would expect them to be in health. Another word for pyrexia is fever. But then if we go the next day and take the patient's temperature again and the temperature's gone, then we would say they are now apyrexial. A means without a pyrexia. So hopefully at the moment you're apyrexial. 
you do not have a pyrexial body temperature. You do not have a fever. An antipyretic is a drug which will bring down body temperature when the patient has a pyrexia. So if we give paracetamol or aspirin or another non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, that will have an antipyretic effect. It will bring down body temperature. But it will only bring the body temperature back down to normal. So if someone's temperature is 39 and we give them paracetamol, that will bring the temperature down very often back down to 37. But if someone's temperature is 37 already, it won't bring it down lower than that because it is is preventing the fever mechanisms which are being generated in the hypothalamus. A pyrogen is something which will increase body temperature. So for example, a bacteria or a virus in the blood can act as a pyrogen. And also the bacterial or viral components in the blood will be recognized by the white blood cells and the white blood cells will release pyrogens. And these pyrogens go to the hypothalamus to increase the body temperature. So the pyro means fire or heat, and gen, of course, means to begin. So the pyrogens will stimulate the development of a temperature. And usually that's a good thing because the body works best, or the immune system of the body works best, at pyrexial temperatures. And that will help to combat the infection. Tacky means abnormally fast. It's the converse of brady, if you remember from earlier on in this presentation. So tachycardia would be a fast heart rate. Tachypnea would be a fast respiratory rate. 